pleasure to introduce you uh, Professor Marco Vannini, who uh, has been, now is retired, but has been professor at the University of Florence uh, at the Department of uh, uh, Animal Biology, I think. Mm -hmm. And he has been also director of the La Specola, the Natural History Museum in Florence, for many years. Uh, he has been uh, uh, studying uh, all his scientific life uh, in vertebrates and uh, in particular behavior of invertebrates. He, most of his work has been done on uh, crabs, but uh, at a certain point of his life he met uh, some interesting snails, and so you will, you will listen what happened with these snails. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Well, what happened was failure and success, I guess. And uh, as you as the title is explaining, there's a good mixture of failure and success, much more failure than success. And uh, those crabs, those uh, snails lives in mangroves, mangrove swamps, which are the kingdom, kingdom of crabs. So the reason I was there was that I was studying crabs, in fact, mangrove crabs, but those little snails were there too. And the first time I saw there in 70, one or 70, I, I, there were 71, 71 uh, in Somalia, somewhere else. I thought that uh, one of those days I should investigate those little snails, which are kind of funny objects. And it took uh, 40, what, 45, 50 years or something like, no, 40 years about. And, uh, and finally, and finally I met those snails again and uh, the occasion to study them. And uh, nothing interesting came out, apparently, so kind of, uh, obvious uh, results and uh, an obvious uh, on a, on a kind of journal uh, without any uh, high uh, EIF. You know, it was something uh, uh, routine, simply routine. But then suddenly with my co-workers we started reflecting on what we had done and there was not, a lot of things we didn't fit at all with our first hypothesis. And uh, that's where I, I will more concentrate at the end of the talk, in the second part of the talk. But let's start from the beginning. So what are uh, those uh, mangrove snails? Okay. Let's uh, split the talk in uh, four obvious uh, sections. Who I'm talking about, where this thing happened, what was done by, by the snails, what are, were they doing, or are they doing, and finally, how they do what they are doing. Most of this case, most of this answer, we, we miss the, the full explanation, except the first one, of course. And who is this, uh, okay, you see this uh, Ceritidia, Ceritidia decolata is a very small gastropod. You see this, uh, it lives on trunks, on uh, mangrove trunks, but it feeds on the floor. It means that every low tide, it go creeping around on the mud surface, and before high tide, he get back on the trunk and climb and the, the 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 trunk and settle somewhere in order to avoid it to be flooded. Some, they live in huge clusters, so on each trunk, in each suitable trunks, you may have hundred or more of these animals. Sometimes there is another of my beloved animals. And this one was the crab who took me there and the responsible for, the, for this research because we were supposed to study those crabs, but then uh, we had more fun with the snails at the end. Well, uh, these mangroves in this part of the world in, 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 is the green spots indicate where mangroves are growing. And uh, that's the the area where Ceritidia lives. So Ceritidia is restricted to the Western Indian Ocean. And that's the place we have been working in. It's a creek along the Kenyan coast somewhere. This is an aerial picture. And you can see that part of the forest is a kind of green, and another part of the forest is a darker kind of green. This corresponds to different trunks, to different uh, trees that you may find there. Rhizophora mucronata is the lowest one, even though the more, more seawards, and Avicinia is the one more concentrated landwards. This is what the Rhizophora looks like. 
Perhaps you've seen pictures of, 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 of uh, uh, where those trees are kind of a, it's a kind of symbol of, of mangroves, mangrove swamp, you know, this, with the aerial roots. And then you have the other kind of, uh, the other tree, which is Abyssinia marina, which is totally different, with the aerial roots. You see these uh, things are coming out from the bottom. So these are, the Rhizophila is breathing with the aerial roots, and uh, the Abyssinia is breathing with the roots, with this kind of Prematophora, it's called, with this kind of snorkel coming out from the mud. But the same, the different adaptation to the same kind of life. Then this is the creek, quite big, you see. That's the spot exactly we have been working in. And uh, this is the area exactly. It's a strip you know, about 200 or 20 meters. We have been working in different places, in different points, and then you will see it here. What? What happens in this kind of, in this condition? It happens to one of the most fascinating okay, it works. One of the most uh, fascinating phenomena, at least for those who live in the Mediterranean Sea, where the tide is very limited or, or unexisting, more or less. But in the in areas, areas where the, the tide is uh, about four meters, at the excursion, maximum excursion, is a fantastic place. Fantastic things happening, and uh, and a very uh, very everything is to be discovered for, for us. I mean, of course, there's been some big work, as big work has been done by other people, by Australia or by South Africa, but, uh, but uh, for a uh, poor Italian or poor Mediterranean people, it's, a, it's kind of the first time, it's, a, it's very incredibly fascinating, the, 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 this kind of a breathing of the ocean, but twice a day, up and down, up and down. You know. Okay, so you see a lot of snails on the floor. Those snails on the floor belong to another species. This is Terebrania palustris, so the same. It's quite related to the one we are, I'm talking, I will soon talk about. But uh, they live in a huge density. And uh, another thing you may notice in this forest is a huge forest, and there are no leaves on the floor. There is no litter at all. And you can imagine why. Because uh, those snails, they feed just on that leaves, as well as the crops that we've seen before. So crops and snails, plenty of crops and snails, just the only leaf of those, uh, leaf, leaf, their life is based on the kind of leaves. So each, every time a leaf, a leaf fall down, is a, a fight between different species, different species of crops and the Telebraia palustris to get and to eat it or to bring it home. Okay. Terebrae Palus is a fascinating, from many points of view, from the kind of applied statistics. You see this funny distribution of the, of the animals that you can get in collecting a certain area. It's a kind of a bimodal or trimodal distribution, but I won't talk about that. This is a... Okay, let's see what's happening exactly with this, finally, with the uh, Selitinia, our Selitinia. The tide is arriving, and it goes. And once the, the water is, is gone, Seritida get down, and much earlier before the next high tide arrive, basta. So the few things that you see crawling or running up and down are little crabs. But the snakes, they just climb much before, sometimes one or two hours before the tide. They settle somewhere, they don't do anything unless the water goes away totally. And once the, the, the platform is free of water, they get down again. Except the little crabs don't care, they just go up and down, run around. Okay? Well, I want to see something more. You see, these are really clustered. The white spot is our fault because we paint each, each animal with this kind of white uh, thickness. You know that I can't show you. Come on. Okay. So you have seen what I. You have seen the the behavior is kind of interesting. So it's kind of you may imagine something controlled by the clock since they move much earlier 
than what the tide is actually doing. They climbed to over two hours about earlier, before. And uh, you may think that this behavior is controlled by a clock, an endogenous, endogenous clock. And we know from the literature that plenty of intertidal animals may rely on the intertidal clock on a, with a 12 hour point four periodicity. You have two, uh, two tides a day. So if you, if you synchronize your biological clock with this, uh, with this uh, physical event, which has a periodicity, and now we will see again, uh, they, you may cope with this problem, like uh, exactly like uh, uh, birds having a diurnal clock, and they wake up and go to bed exactly when the when the sun the sun uh, is, is of course synchronized with the sun. Okay, the time. The point is that we have just concentrate on the tide phenomenon to go ahead with the rest of the story. So tide is uh, something. Uh, imagine that this is the Earth and Moon. We know that the uh, tide is related to the moon, and you see the imagine that this blue stuff here is the water. Can you imagine that the water is a kind of uniform mass all around the all around the Earth, all around our planet? So it's not a uniformly distributed because the moon is attracting part of the water. So we have a bump here because this water is a, here the water is very heavy, and here water is less heavy. Okay, so this is the the, the, the well, the moon attraction, okay? You may ask yourself, what about the second bump? Why do we have two instead of one? Are you interested in it? Yes. Yes? yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is the axis of the barycenter of the, of the planet. Rotation is represented by A axis. So the, the Earth is turning around the barycenter. But, the system and moon earth, imagine as a, as a solid, so, so now a solid, uh, solid system, has a body center which is different, but the, the final body center of the, of the complex system, moon earth, is B. So if this B is the body center, you have a centrifugal force which is responsible, is responsible for, this, for this bump. So this bump is due to the centrifugal force of the rotation Earth-Moon system. And this bump is simply the attraction of the Moon. So you have two bumps, two big waves a day. Okay, so the, at the same time, we know that the Moon is, a, is rotating around the Earth with a periodicity, 24 hours point eight, which means uh, that the rotation around the, the Earth takes a uh, uh, 20 hour 48 or 48 minutes, uh, one day plus 48 minutes. It means that the moon is crossing the zenith 48 minutes with a delay, a lunar delay, with a continuous delay of 48 minutes. Each day the moon will be on our head with a delay of 48 minutes, as an average. And the other thing we have to know about is that the moon and sun can be, and the second point is that the sun is also acting on the water uh, mass, and a part of the tide is also due to the sun attraction, not only to the moon. Uh, the moon is more important than the sun, but at least when the two uh, objects here are on the same axis, no matter if the new moon with, on this side or on the right side, the full moon, is exactly the same since we have two bumps, so when the moon is on the same axis as the sun. The forces, the sun forces and moon forces are out there. So the bump gets bigger. So the high tides are much higher. And when they are in a position, so they have, the, sorry, we have the spring tides, the higher, very high, the low, very low. And when you have the opposition, the other condition, so the, we call it nip tide, the moon is acting against the sun. The moon is stronger, as I told you, because it's closer, of course. And, uh, but in any case, in this condition, we have the mid tide, which means the high tide are quite low, and the low tide is quite high. Putting all these things together, you have, a, you have the synodic bump, which means uh, the, the 29 point days that uh, you have between two different, the distance between two and four moon, so the old uh, moon, uh, Lunar month is a 29.5. It's not 30, it's not 31, it's simply 29.5. Uh, 
and uh, which means uh, uh, 29 days, 12 and 40, 44. But in this image, I will show you exactly the, the, the effect on the, on, the, on the surface, on the, on the coast. This is a, a tidal uh, pattern of the Kenyan coast, and you see we can reach in certain moment uh, 3.7 which uh, is 3.7 meters or 0 meters and uh, uh, this is uh, when you have full moon or new moon and very low, uh, very low uh, observation between uh, what can be between uh, 2 and 1 and uh, 1 point whatever, you know, very small, very much smaller, much more reducing uh, uh, movement, water movement during mid time okay, mid time is mid time, okay I, once we know this detail, you know, what we need to know about uh, uh, we, we, the rest of the talk. Any questions? No. Okay. Uh, now I'll show something a bit more intriguing. These are the, not the difference, but not, there is no represented here high and low to water, but simply the peak high water, the high water peaks, which means that the spring tide, the water can reach uh, 3.7, and the nip tide it can reach 2.2. Uh, but you can see that these are the, each peak is a single tide, is a single high tide. So it means that the two, uh, for the two tides of the same day, the two consecutive tides, can be very different from each other. So this is a, uh, this is a 2.2. Uh, 2.9 perhaps, and the following one is 2.4. Then you have another one, uh, 2. Point, uh, no, it can be sorry, it can be 2.2. Then another one is uh, 2.7, and then again 2.2, which means it can be half meter an example of difference between the morning low tide or the morning high tide and the evening high tide. So there is a variation from spring tide to nip tide. A spring tide that basically higher, much higher, okay? They're always at this level. And, and the and nip tide are very low. But at the same time, you have a strong variation between the two consecutive tides, which is called diurnal disparity. And if you want to know why, I'll tell you later. And again, if you imagine that this morning the tide was a, a high tide was at eight o'clock, you expect that tomorrow morning it will be at eight o'clock point four forty eight minutes. No, nearly nine o'clock. Day after again would be you know again uh, the, the double of forty eight or whatever. So because they say forty eight delay each uh, each day is an average delay of the moon which is also sometimes delaying uh, 50 minutes, sometimes 40, 45, or something like that. But the tide is much more crazy the pattern, because sometimes at spring tide, the delay can be just half an hour, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, half an hour, but at nip tide, it can reach a 2 or even 2.7 delay. You have th this morning, it was at 10 in the morning, and, and tomorrow it will be at 12.20. Uh, so the incredible, incredible variation of uh, of, uh, of this pattern, which is uh, you have a monthly, irregular, monthly variation, a daily variation, and uh, <coughs> a daily variation not only in time but also in eighth of the of the of the tide itself. So when people is talking about a tidal clock, internal clock, which tend the tend to control the animal behavior to synchronize it with the tide. Sometimes, unless you don't see all these details, the thing is quite convincing, because the sun is very regular, so in this period, sun is about 6 in the morning till 6 in the evening, and so it's, it doesn't change at all, it is very regular, it can increase till, till the 21st of June, and then decrease, but it is very regular. And uh, sometimes you never see, you never see in, uh, in all this paper existing, especially on fiddle crops, perhaps you have heard about fiddle crops, there is plenty of literature about the tidal clock and tidal uh, synchronization. But I never seen stretch to the fact that tide is a very, very regular and strange stuff. And to synchronize with this pattern is not as obvious as synchronizing with the sun. 
but I didn't realize that until <laughs> until uh, uh, having already started the work. Let's see again. Okay, so we were looking for crabs, but at the same time it was kind of fun to to to, to work with this strange nail, which were going up and down. And so we're doing with no instruments at all. We start doing something with my students, my first students, and what we could see that there was during the high high tide, the hundred percent of snails were in top of the tree, not in top, in the right in the right position. Then they were most of them get down, and then again up at spring tide. Something very irregular at nip tide, with many animals remaining on the floor sometimes, since the, the water sometimes doesn't even reach the platform where they live. So they can remain and stick on the floor without bothering because they, they will, it will be safe for one or two or more tides. And then what they have been doing, we make some little exchange. You have animals from the upper shore, animals from the lower shore. So these ones are used to, to be <coughs> very very precise in their in their um, movement their migration pattern very precise and having they have to crawl much higher than those living on the upper shore which are not bothered by the water for many days and even if they are bothered they only have to climb 10 or 20 centimeters because here there is the limit of the high water of spring tide so the the upper avicennia is hardly reached by, by the, uh, during certain spring tide, the water may not even reach them. And occasionally you see a lot of dead animals there and crabs. So what they've been doing, which is, which is obvious for those uh, who have been working on uh, this kind of problems, you know, migration orientation and read, we exchange the animals. And what happened? So we, we didn't have a metric, even we had no instruments at all. We didn't have a, a metro. We have to build our own meter here with a pencil or a stick, something like that. We have plenty of cameras and that's uh, and nothing good. And what we found that, uh, you see, this is, you have animals from the upper trees and these are the animals from the lower trees. So these are 100% on the tree, and then nothing, and then 100%, and then they get down. But on the, those in top were absolutely most of the time down, and they, in the middle there was an intermediate condition. First thing, they're on the trees, on the floor, on the trees, and this condition, they, half of them get down and half remain on the trees. Why? We don't know. We never could find out, and we, uh, it was a kind of nightmare guessing why so this was a we say we will do it in the future and this future never came so sometimes the, the migration exists but is uh, reducing not reducing the, the right moment is the right moment you know but uh, and when i have to climb back here they are climbing much before the tide arrives but uh, we don't know why sometimes they get there is no relation with the with the sun or weather condition but what we did at a certain moment we mark the animals we exchange the animals and what have we done? Yeah, we took the animal from the lower uh, trees to the upper one. This is hours of flooding period. Those animals are Gracias. those animals uh, are live in a place where there is an average eight hour of inundation of flooding, and those animals are four hours a day. So the condition they live is quite different. And uh, once we exchange it, this is very primitive uh, experimental procedure and very uh, artisanal, artisanal, artisanal. And so you see the, here the, well, the, the market, the, the white one, which are the, those who are already living here, and the uh, uh, violet one, which are those who have been taken from the lower uh, uh, levels. And here you see, without any uh, statistics, uh, uh, complicated statistics, that uh, which we did, in fact. But anyhow, the image in itself is, a, is a sufficient to explain you the different behavior. The animals coming from lower levels, they go ahead and climbing like if the water was coming. So it means that uh, they didn't have any direct information. They, their clock will tell them uh, at what time to start climbing and at the same time how high to climb which is not very obvious. The clock uh, can tell you when, but uh, how high is, a, is, a, is another leader. That is a, is a different problem. But those animals may rely on the same, uh, those, those two information. And for at least four, four days, about eight tides, 
the two groups remain uh, behaving quite different, and after eight times they were overlapping each other. So it's a process of forgetting about animal. So we published some nice paper here or there, and the explanation was a biological clock, a biological clock with, uh, which controlling both phenomena. But here is the moment I told you before, we start reflecting. Did we really find something interesting, which was not? There was a literature about, uh, uh, about a, a feeder crab, which was already, we were just a repeating experiment which had been done on feeder crabs without any innovation. We just I told you, because we were there for fun, we were concentrating on, on, on mangrove crabs more than, but having two papers done just for fun wasn't, <laughs> wasn't on quite good paper, on quite good journal, was already a kind of success, okay? But then we started reflecting with Sara Fratini, which was my main co-worker at that time. But how can such a clock to cope with the tidal complicated pattern? First of all, how can you tell when and how, when and at which distance? That's the first problem. The second problem is that the tide is very complicated. So what the conclusion was that a snail climbed more or less regularly in time and high enough to not get flooded. Translocation doesn't affect the rhythmic behavior. Snail climbed a different age according to the shore level. If translocated, snail behavior is expected at home. And the problem remains how. What kind of signal may tell the snails when and how high to climb? And here start the old stuff becoming intriguing. And so from that, about 10 years ago, no, in 75, we forget about crabs, more or less definitely, and we concentrate on, on snails, having some more efficient apparatus, not very high tech, anyhow. This is plastic pipes, and uh, two meters long, and, uh, and this is Sarah, which is just marking the pipe to allow us to, to really exactly define where the animals is stopping. And then we are releasing the marked snails at the base of the pipe. So the only high-tech instruments in this picture, can you find it? Can you find out? Something who took years to find out and decide how to proceed in this case. We made a lot of mistakes before, a lot of uh, sufferance. Of Sarah's boot. There is, it's not very easy to walk in the mud. And there's a few shoes that you can wear without suffering. And sometimes we prefer to have wear no shoes at all. Usually there is not sticking or cutting anything. And so it, it's, it's quite safe to walk without shoes as well. But uh, not, not totally, in fact, because this pneumatophore is quite flexible, but in fact, uh, that uh, annoying stuff. So this is a scuba diving uh, suite. The, the, sorry, the, the boots are part of the scuba diving suite. Only those kind of of uh, foam. How much is it? Polypropylene. How much is it? Neoprene. Okay, the neoprene, neoprene, neoprene. Uh, 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 typical use for for a uh, scuba diving suite is uh, the one we use. Uh, the boots, so we purchased plenty of boots without the rest of the of the stuff. Yeah? And this was the only uh, suitable. If you ever happen to you to go in a mangrove swamp, sooner or less, I hope and I I, I, I that you and I, wish, I hope you could and I wish uh, I, I wish you may enjoy it. But don't forget to buy to purchase this kind of boots. Okay. So the only limits to your fantasy, experimental fantasy, then, is only limited, limited by the number of pipes that you can afford to buy, and they are quite cheap after all, and the number of people you may use to work with all these pipes. And I, I'm sorry here that uh, that Matilde is not here. He's, uh, you know, he's a colleague of the, in the doctorato here in Pisa. This is Matilde, because I'm one, I, I guess some of you knows Matilde. And this is the rest of the crew, which is now a different part of the world. And uh, and this is uh, what uh, the only limitation are pipes, as I told you, and students. So since uh, that time, I just 
went several times in, in this Bida Creek in Kenya with huge mass of students which are affording to pay their trip and but sharing expenses and renting a single bus or mini bus of one or two it was quite quite uh, affordable for all of us because I also was out of money at that time so I was still uh, teaching but uh, with no money at all but we could uh, or nearly or nearly so we could uh, enjoy a lot of uh, lot of done, a lot of work, and the number of pipes at the end of our stuff this, <coughs> of three or four years ago was a kind of a nightmare, but we had plenty of stuff. <coughs> then we need the white tipex, and then you need the nothing else. You mark the snails, and you can exchange, move them, and check them, and take pictures. Okay, we take pictures, how? Okay, the only thing, you can stick around with the camera and every half an hour, take a, or 15 minutes, take a picture, four pictures for each pipe on, the, on those four sides, okay? And, uh, but then we did something more technological, you will see later. Just see those pipes, it's the same pipe. We have pictures in the 20, 25, 28, uh, th uh, 3rd of August, uh, in many years ago. And you see this is the barycenter of the cluster. They're the same pipe, exactly, the same animals. This is the barycenter of the cluster, and this is the place where water, reached by the water, of the high water. So it means that the barycenter of the cluster is always a 38, if I remember, well, centimeters above the water level. It's incredibly precise, incredibly efficient system. The, the animals are quite well clustered, and the body center, in any case, is very, very, uh, can be foreseen in, in, uh, by the level of uh, that water we reach. And uh, this is, means that, if, don't forget that these animals are clustering there one or two hours before, when there is no water at all, not around, you cannot even see or perceive or smell anything, you know? It's a forest, you are within a forest, and then the animals see the animal running away, and then you can just set your clock and see that one uh, and a half hour later, the tide will be there. Okay, the first thing we ask, we ask ourselves is that perhaps there is some information about the previous tide. So if an animal is arriving and stopping a certain level, does the level it stops has to do with the previous tide? So the tide is T minus one. Or perhaps from the, the one of the day before, tide minus two. So this is about 12 hours, this is about 24 hours before. Uh, you see this is the level animal reach compared with the tide level, the minus one. There is absolutely no relationship. But we know that because we have seen the two consecutive tides are very different from each other. So if animal may be thinking or perceiving something of the previous, just the previous tide, there will be a, absolutely a mistake. But the, the one of the day before is quite well related. Okay? So you may think that the animal, these animals are just rem remembering something of the day before. But if you make a relationship with the following tide, the tide is not yet there, the one who will come, you see that the correlation is much higher, and these two indexes are totally, absolutely different and statistically different. So animals are correlated with the tide which is not yet there. And then the reason why we could publish this paper is a nail that can foresee the future. And uh, I don't know if we can foresee it, but we cannot yet really explain how they can do it. But let's go ahead. The first thing we thought that external signals must those exist, some cues from the external environment who can tell the animals. You may have a kind of clock, a kind of clock who say that more or less pay attention because in a while the tide will come. But then when exactly and how high, you may have some external signal. Where are those signals? Uh, to improve our technology, we made uh, three pipes and the camera you see here, a uh, photo camera here, and then another one on the other side. So you have to, this, you have not the fourth side of the pipe of the, each pipe, but you have two sides of the pipe, and you can uh, and you can then have good information, automatic information, without manipulating, without doing anything. There is a kind of a gutter all around that animal will not easily cross. So those animals will be, remain always the same. They may exchange pipes, but not uh, coming out. And this is powerful. This is, they love it, and they don't bother at all, and they, they do more or less exactly what they do on trunks, even if here is much more easy 
to, 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 to know what they're doing. You can, we can measure it. We have some shadow, and we are, we are very proud of our, of our system. We have, and, and so let's see, we've been going ahead some time for 45 days. And then is a kind of a nightmare again. There is no a general rule to take out of it, except some anecdotal e e examination. You see that during the springtime, the, uh, this is the uh, number of animals staying on the trunk. So this is 100%, but sometimes 90, which means that 10% were just on the floor at low tide, of course. And then they go up and down again. But during the, between spring and nip, there is a lot of animals with things which are more evident. At low, at, at low tide, most of them were going on the floor. At high tide, all of them were on top, of course. Then you see, look at here. You have, ah, sorry, sorry. This green line is the level, uh, the, the, the threshold, I mean, in uh, explaining at which, at which level the platform was flooded, which means that uh, this is the meters level, water level. At 2.9, is it third meter, two meters, three meters? At 2.9, when the tide was at 2.9, was hardly reaching the trunks we were making experiments on, or the pipes we were working in. So with tides higher than 2.9, the platform was flooded. Lower than 2.9, the pl platform was dry, or sometimes even too, too dry for the animals. Okay, so you see that these animals, they're climbing and then getting down, then suddenly, they don't bother at all. This have a, a tide which doesn't reach the green line, and animals, they know exactly there, and so they remain on the floor without bothering to even approach the tree sometimes. Then you have a, a dangerous tide, right? and animals climb, all of them. Then you have a not dangerous tide, and the animals just remain on the floor. And here again, they have a, a and then a, suddenly, they, near the spring tide, they all remain there. They are still on top of the tree. No one is going around anywhere. Then again, they start going up and down. Look here, there's a long nip tide with no tide reaching the platform. The animals remain on the floor, permanent on the floor, unless after two, three days, the floor is too dry and too hot. And then gradually, gradually they start climbing again. But this is different, not because they were flooded, simply because it was too hot for them. And then again. What we can, how, the question was the, the previous question. How can they know when to start and how I, how to climb? What kind of signals do exist? For the moment, we can ex exclude direct gra gravity perception. If we had information about that, it would be very easy when to start climbing and how high. Okay? You, feel very, you feel very light. You, you know that the powerful attraction traction on top of your head. And before, before flooding, you go very high and quickly, and they avoid the flooding. But the variation, gravity variation, of, uh, of uh, in terms of gravity force, the variation w w between uh, high tide and low tide is one millionth. So if an animal is, a, is a, a one gram heavy, like our uh, Ceritidia, the variation is about one millionth of gram, which means a droplet of water, or if you pee or whatever do, snails do instead of peeing, it will change your the, the signal. So it, it's too small. For being a for being a for, a, for an animal for a snail perception, even if with animals we have always to be very careful because even you know battle echolocation is too difficult for an animal, or perhaps a, a pigeons a pigeons smell or olfactory map is too crazy for being a, for being a, a real thing. You know we have to be careful when we think an animal cannot do something. We should uh, not to be too confident with physiologists or, 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 or uh, other biologists. We seem to already know about it. But this is a one million of a variation is really too little for being uh, for being uh, perceived by snails, in my opinion, for the moment. Yeah. Wave noise, impossible. The place, the platform we were working, the first two hours before the flood, the water fringe was two mil, one mile away, and there was no noise at all, because the water is climbing very slow with no noise, nothing. 
direct vision of the seawater, impossible. In a forest, you won't see anything away more than five meters. And this is, I told you, one, one mile or sometimes two miles away. Chemical within the soil. We did some research manipulating the substratum, changing, exchanging, or, or digging, or whatever, nothing. We never find any relationship. Even electrostatic variation was supposed to exist, because plants may do. Then we repeated the experiments later, I'll show you. Uh, but it didn't make any platform, any result. Platform inclination. We dig under the mud a big wood platform, and then we lift it over a few millimeters. Why? Because someone thought that uh, when the water mass come close to the continent, the weight of all this mass may just push down the, the earth, uh, the earth, uh, the coastal uh, limestone, and even a few millimeters. But if you can perceive this variation, you would have a right information. But uh, it was even supposed to the geologist who told me, but are you sure that this, this uh, uh, tilting of the, of the limestone exists? I say, I'm not really sure. You can try anyhow. And so I did try. And we could, uh, we could uh, well, I'll tell you, how can you make a, a wood platform like a, as big as a door to lift two, three, or four millimeters? It was a, something genius of a, of a student of mine. And uh, the, we put the, under the platform seed of a cheshi. What is it? Cheshi. How is it? Chickly. Chickpeas, dry chickpeas. And dry chickpeas absorb water, and they grow up, and they expand themselves, and uh, and uh, and they just we could just have this effect, which takes a lot of effort. We put a lot of chickpeas, and, <laughs> and once they start absorbing water, the the platform start moving, <laughs> but the, the the snails didn't bother at all, absolutely. Living in, working in a tropical country like that obliges you to have this kind of a, of cause, uh, <laughs> to rely on the resource of this kind. Okay, we don't have, we could not really invent some more complicated mechanical instruments, but the chickpeas was perfect. Other possible signals: soil variation in terms of pH, no results. Electrical potential variation between roots and canopy, which was different from the electrostatic stuff. And they put electrode between, uh, uh, in comparing the, the different potential difference between root and canopy, Mancuso started. Like Mancuso was a professor in Florence of, of plant neurobiology, which is kind of contradictory stuff, but uh, he find, he's finding out um, quite funny things. But in this case, he found a, a potential variation, but only with the 24 hours periodicity. This depending on the uh, chlorophyll and activity of leaves. So this is every every day you can measure a difference, and but it's very regularly with the synchronized with the sun, of course, or caused by the sun. Chemical information on the track, or visual cues of something happening in the canopy, or again a chemical released by the trees, by the canopy, not by the floor, and again soil vibration due to the ocean wave impact. And the wave impact is about seven kilometers away. And there is a small reef in Kenya in that area. And of course, during high tide, you have the wave uh, are hitting the coast with more energy. And uh, so if you are on the coast having a drink on a nice cafe on the coast, African coast, and, uh, and you can perceive, oh, the tide is, uh, is growing up. You can notice the difference of the noise difference, the sound of the wave, but not seven kilometers away with a huge forest in between, which also absorbing absorbing uh, 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 vibration, uh, uh, sound vibration. OK. Chemical cues left on the trunk by the sea or conspecific. We, what we did, we lowered the pipe. We had two pipes, and we lowered it in the mud. My, 15 or 30, 30 centimeters down. And the hypothesis is that if the snails use the, some chemical marks, once they are feeding around and once they are having, coming back, the control pipe, they will go exactly somewhere, somewhere. But those who have been put down, the animal will stop 15 or 30 centimeters lower than control, which they did not. 
So this white stuff they should have done, but this black stuff is what they have done compared to the two controls. So animals were not affected by our manipulation, pipe manipulation. No chemicals marks on the pipes. Visual cues from the canopy. Uh, we dig, a, we buried under the mud another huge wood platform, under the mud for one day or two days perhaps, and then we lift it up. We, we, put, we, we removed the platform, which was nicely covered by, by mud and snails during low tide. So there was plenty of snails all around there. Some remain around this part, and some were just already on this platform. So very, very gently we removed the platform. We put a table under it. So the hypothesis, if snails rely on visual cues from the canopy, they will be affected by this manipulation. Otherwise, they won't. So this is our final uh, stuff. This is animals climbing from the platform on this side. And those are animals climbing from the mud, from the, from the natural mud, from the other side. OK. This is the, 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 the platform is 60 centimeters high than the, 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 the wood platform is 60 centimeters high than the, than the platform, than the, the mud. And here are the results. Animals, you know, the, starting from blue spot, uh, were high 70 centimeters than those starting from the floor. So we, which is quite similar to the manipul our manipulation, 60 centimeters. But we repeat it several times, and the second one was 60.9. So the animal were just exactly, the animals coming from, uh, from, the, from the platform were climbing exactly 60 centimeters or 61 centimeters higher than those starting from the, from the muddy surface. So exactly, so they didn't have any external reference. They had in mind that they have to climb, uh, uh, they have to climb uh, one point, uh, you know, was it? Uh, they have to climb uh, 70 or something like that. They have to be in mind, in brackets, if they have a mind, I don't know. In mind, they have in mind to have to climb 70 centimeters. And what they did, no matter if we started from the floor or from the pla or from the, our platform, there was no external information telling them they were going in an extremely high position. They never reached. Uh, I forgot to tell you that in this, con this, place, in this place where we were, we were working, the maximum tidal height was 80 centimeters. So those, no one of these nails needs to never need to go more than one meter, one meter uh, and ten. So going, uh, going uh, one till 160 or something like that was an extremely high for them. So they should have a walking down and say, a terrified by such a, such a level they reach. But of course, they weren't terrified at all. They were just doing what they had in mind to do. OK. No visual marks. Direct evaluation from the ground. So the previous experiments will tell you something about that. They cannot go up and, and then perceive how far they are from the platform. We repeat it with another technique, but I, I won't bother you. Okay, let's go ahead. So animals cannot evaluate from the pipe, once they're on top of the pipe, how high they are from the, from the bottom. So the question is, how the snail is able to measure the right distance? I don't know how they have in mind, they have in mind to travel 80 centimeters. I, we don't know, we still don't know. But imagine that they have a, they know it. The second question is how they can measure it. Once you know that, how can you, this, once you have decided that you have to walk for 80 centimeters, how can you measure this distance? We have, again, a few hypotheses, two in fact. The step counter hypothesis. The animals say that when it's 80 centimeters, it means uh, those snails, uh, if you see them when they're uh, in, in life, you know, on the tree, when they walk, they're not uh, creeping like our garden snail. They really make single steps, you know, something very discontinuous. So even uh, we can count their steps, and, but they can perhaps as well, or even better, count their own steps. So if they can count the steps, no matter. Once they decide that this is a place for 220 steps, they can count them and then reach the right the position. So to investigate what we can do, we can incline the pipes. So the steps will remain the same on inclined pipe, but they will not reach the right distance from the floor. Right? 
because if you have to reach one meter from the floor, but you use on a, on a, uh, you work at, on, on this pipe, it will be uh, one by diviso, uh, divided by a factor 1.4, which is the diagon diagonal instead of, a, of the side of the rectangle, okay? Is a elementary geometry as per you are familiar with. Uh, so if the, if the snails reach the same level above the soil, it means they have to make much more steps than what they, have done, they could have done just walking and uh, scraping in vertical. In fact, they do re reach the same level no matter, how number, no matter how many steps they have to uh, walk with. They, they expected that if they were counting steps with these and what they did, which is compared exactly the same to what they did on control pipes, vertical pipes. So there is no anything to be counted. They simply can really evaluate the distance. And the idea is that uh, from elementary physics course, you remember that the, the, the work you do when you push a, a, a mass along a, along a surface is the, the same effort is need to reach a certain level, no matter if this is reached to a very inclined surface or vertical stuff. It means that the force, uh, the work done is the, the force applied and multiplied by the distance, which is independent of uh, the, how the distance is calculated on a nearly horizontal, vertical, or whatever. Sorry for this uh, nasty explanation, but I hope that you have studied physics recently and perhaps you, you could understand better than what I'm really exp trying to explain. How can it affect their behavior now, making them more heavy? If they can, cal if they can calculate the effort they need, which means that they're going this way or going this way, uh, the, the final effort will be mostly the same, but if you put some lead, it was kind of lead on, on top of them, the, the effort will be much higher because they have to carry something on their shoulder. So we attach some no, lead, the lead the plates, and increasing their weight of uh, three levels, you know, very heavy with the heavy stuff, medium and light with no weight at all. So now we have the hypothesis is that if they, those with heavy lead on their back are not reaching the same level, it means that there's a energetic cost hypothesis is, is valuable. If they reach the same level, we have no hypothesis yet to, to discuss or no hypothesis to put forward. But in this case, the results were positive. Though the, the light or no, no wedge, wedge were going higher, and those with a heavy wedge were not reaching as high as, their, as, their, as, as control. Which means that what they do, the animals, is allocating at least in our hypothesis, before starting the migration, they allocate a certain amount of energy. Today, is a, the, the trip I need to do is a kind of a 3.5 kilojoule. And, and they start, and one day, once the, the kilojoule has gone, the animal stops. Uh, I don't know, kilojoule or microjoule, I don't know. I just, I just uh, <laughs> invented now. Anyway, so the, the animal can allocate a certain amount of energy, and each day, for each migration, this amount of energy to be allocated is varying, it's changing. It, it could confirm somehow this hypothesis, comparing for the first time exactly what they do on trunks and what they do on pipes, how fast they climb and how high they climb. So the, the pipes is much more easy to climb on and uh, much more so, uh, smooth. So animal here should go higher and faster if the alloca energy allocation was uh, acceptable. So the, no matter what they allocate here, it will be more difficult to climb a certain level. Here is, they will go higher. And what they did, in fact, see the level on pipes was a, uh, the condition we make in this experiment was 89. They reached 89 centimeters instead of 71. 71, and uh, in the and uh, it was increased by 25 percent, and the speed is the same. They get much faster, you no, know, much. In fact, you know, oh, oh, oh. 
much faster with the increasing their speed of 39%, which is a quite a big difference. They go very fast instead of creeping, creeping away, less fast in the other case. So if those things are put together, you may think that the, that the energy hypothesis it makes sense. But of course, the real experiment should be done, it's not yet been done by anybody, that affecting their biology, their, their metabolism somehow. Some, I don't know how, should be a biochemistry to, to help. So affecting their, their energetic metabolism could be the, can somehow the proof that, that uh, the, what they do is exactly an evaluation, an energetic allocation. We don't still know how they can decide that today is the two joule energy instead of three, but at least part of the problem would be, would find his solution. Then the last, but not least, or last, just last. Uh, if the allocation theory is correct, when the animal will start to decide to how much to allocate? They are going around, creeping, and then a certain moment they get back, they run somehow back to the trunk, and they climb. So, but the point, uh, they may reach sometime very far, sometime sticking around the tr trunk or pipe. So, how can they decide when to, to decide this is the point zero, this is a, the three, two, one, go and, and start climbing. So we did some uh, experiment. You now we made, created something called sidewalk around the pipe. The sidewalk is 10 centimeters wide and say here is about 10 centimeters high. So we released animal from this part which we did, didn't cross the sidewalk, or this is the control, I just put on the same image what we did on the control pipe, and the experimental pipe, they have to go this way, then climb, and then again horizontal, then again the pipe. So the point is, would they add this distance and this distance to reach the same level, the correct level, I mean, or once they will be on a horizontal, platform which they forget about and start again to have a zero here. So if they, if they forget, they will go higher. If they don't forget, they will go at the same level exactly. Okay. Then we made another platform, again, several in fact. Again, which is about eight, eight, sorry, 10 centimeters above the soil, but with a much wider platform, let's say 30 centimeters. So these animals are climbing again, 10, then walking for 30 centimeters, and then climbing. And in this case, they forget. So it means when the, 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 the sidewalk platform is, is only 10 centimeters wide, they can add this distance and then the second part, the trip, and reach in the same level than contrary. But when the platform is wider than 10 centimeters, and we made it 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, uh, then the animal, they climb, then they find again a wide stuff horizontal, they say, well, it's a mistake, I'm still on the floor. Okay? So they reset their, their, their mechanism, and then here they, tr they found the trunk, they say, okay, then it's my zero, they start, and they go exactly 10 centimeters above. Okay, so this means that the, the, the zero starts exactly the base of the vertical trip until their horizontal the mechanism doesn't start, no matter how far from the pipe they, they reach. But once they're at the base of the pipe or trunk, they set the zero of their mechanism and start calculating their energy stuff and reach the right level. See, addition but not subtraction. They can add two segments, but they cannot subtract. Subtract, you can imagine, we, make a, we dig a hole, so the animals were walking this way, they're getting down, then climbing the, 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 climbing the pipe from a lower level. So this was a, they were subtracting this or not? No, they don't. So if they let them climb from zero, which is 20 or 30 centimeters under the soil, they simply reach 20, 30 centimeters or less. They, they, they put that direct zero there and they just, uh, they will get a lower level than control. So the no subtraction is just addition. So when I say aware of, aware of distance, how they are aware of the distance they can reach, they're still unknown, insist still unknown. How does snail, let's concentrate again on when, how the snail can decide when starting. A few remaining hypotheses are remaining. 
chemical information from the trees. Are the trees releasing, releasing something from the leaves which can be perceived by the snails? The animals, the, sorry, the plants can perceive with the roots something happened in the phreatic fall uh, mm -hmm. Well, under the roots, perhaps uh, the, the, there is some, the seawater is coming, and part of the seawater is coming under the, under the level. Mm -hmm. Can penetrate through, through the mud and, and lower levels. And I uh, also have to remind that the limestone, which is under the mud and under the, the mangroves, is a kind of a gruyere hole and a and, uh, and, uh, lot of uh, easy, easy to be penetrated by the seawater, even if you don't see the outside, if you don't see the, the, the wave arriving, the water can somehow creep under the, the, the soil level, some, perhaps, perhaps. But if the trees have their roots down in the mud, they can perhaps perceive it, which is also wrong, because the mangrove roots, they don't go very far, they go very deep. But anyhow, we wanted to test this hypothesis, and we made tents. We put a, a tent, just we enclose those pipes in a tent like that, uh, do I say? Like that, and we have three experimental set. The first was a free air with an open tent as a control. Then we have a, a, a sealed tent, closed, absolutely closed, and then a tent with, with uh, what, um, air circulation. But this air came from uh, oceanic, uh, on the, from the ocean, with the, using bottles which have been filled, which have been filled on the sea. For, for scuba diving uh, people, you know, so we went to the station, scuba diving station, we, had, we took two or three of uh, these bottles, in, in fact, three times, so we have about 10 or 12 of these bottles, and we opened the valve and released this water, this um, air within the tent to, uh, to, affecting, to affect the, the, the possible smell or chemical cues released from the environment, from the trees, for instance. So if it's nice to rely on our aerial cues, treatment two or three would affect them, while the first one is a pure control. A control we also have without tent at all, anyhow. And the result is that, this is the, the bottles, and the result is that uh, there was no difference at all. In three different days, white is uh, one day, dark gray is the second day, this is the third day again, there was no difference. So the, the three white stop are the same, the three gray stop are more or less the same, the three uh, pale gray stop, gray stop are also the same. There is no difference. And uh, when I say bottles, you say it's a bit more do different. We have a, don't have a picture, unfortunately, because if you have, if you let the air coming out from one or 200 atmosphere pressure, uh, first of all, it's very dangerous. So you have to have a, a pressure reductor, a pressure stuff to reduce this, uh, this, uh, this uh, water uh, outflow. The second thing, it comes out very cold, very cold. So you have to let it flow it uh, through a warm water um, bottles, uh, allowing the, the airflow to reach the local temperature. The third thing is that it's very dry. And again, letting this water flow passing, circulating through a huge bottle of seawater, still from the ocean. So the, the, finally, the water, the airflow ha was having the right temperature and the water humidity to be compared more or less with the local one. Anyhow, there was no problem because there was no difference at all. If we had some difference, we should have more investigated, but there was no difference at all, so was a, we, we didn't bother with more detail about them. Then we need, finally, a new finding just by chance. I don't remember why, but at a certain moment we put one of those pipes very far. In a, you see here, Rhizophora forest, the one which is very low and very far, which is not inhabited at all by the snails. There is no snails of, of these species around, because here the water can reach 172 meters. So this is not an environment suitable for these snails. They've never been there. No one of those have never uh, been there. So we put the pipe there. And what was extraordinary is that these snails start immediately climbing and stopping here. 
one four, one five. They, they, they immediately, they didn't bother sticking around like they were doing in the control pipes, but immediately going and going very high. And sometimes 1.5 or 1.4 was not enough, but then when the water rises again, they have to climb and, and, and reach a, a, the end of the pipe, or sometimes they had been washed away by the wave, because when water rises, you have more, some waves. The wind is, is no, is a, let, is a, uh, moving the water surface, and this is what they really avoid, they wanted to avoid. That's the reason why they only live on the upper mangrove belt, on the upper mangrove with the other tree species, because when water arrives there, there is no wave at all. There is, is already the, the water movement has been already filtered by the forest. But this is a very close to the open ocean, or the open lagoon, so the sun, any little wind will create waves and sometimes Mechanically took them, take them away, uh, removing them. Okay. So those animals, they perceive that they were in a dangerous place. They perceive that the, their the depth was very high. And what we did after uh, we measure, we compare the pipes in different position, and you see that there is a relationship, different days, and the relationship between the the le, the water level of the incoming tide and the level reached by the snails was very well uh, correlated. And the same, this is at the speed, the, this is very fast and very slowly, very fast uh, reaction and climbing. And this is a, no, sorry, the opposite. This is very fast. When in, on pipes, uh, on pipes, uh, when the tide was going 100 and was a 1.5 meters, the animals immediately, this is the, uh, sorry, the time they were sticking around before climbing. So when there was no danger, they were sticking around for four or five hours sometimes. When there was a big danger in their mind, at least, they were just taking less than one hour, they were immediately climbing. Okay. So to have more information about that, we made a long line of 11 pipes. And what we see that the correlation still is very nice. And uh, uh, as higher as the tide will be, and as uh, as far as the pipe from the from the coast, as higher the snails reach, and they never this is the maximum level that at home the, the snails can reach, usually between 70 and 80. But when they are in a dangerous condition, they go much higher, and that this, that's, that's, that's the average. The, the first hypothesis was that. Uh, there might be some information on the mud. The, here, on the, on the last pipe, the mud surface was flooded for much longer than I showed you before, one of the, perhaps seven, eight hours a day, while on the, on the highest of this pipe, perhaps only three or four hours a day. It means, this means that the sediment was affected, or could be affected. You have more time for growing the cyanobacteria. You have more time for for letting uh, planktonic organisms to sink on the floor, whatever you can you can imagine. And in fact, even walking across this transect, you can see that the kind the sand is different. And we know we have the sand is different. We know we have data about that about organic content. Organic content is is, is higher as far as you move away from the from the. Coast, from the from the coastline. Okay, so we try again to affect the sediment. You know, we dig them, we exchange the sediment with a lot of the disturbance, disturbance of of the sediment with no effect at all. So animals are really afraid of the of staying some, some, somewhere very far from the coast, or somewhere where the water will come very very high. And this is uh, against what we know about. Uh, invertebrates, I would say. What does it mean to be afraid of something? What can they know about how the, the tide will hide, the tide will be in a certain spot of the same mangrove, which is absolutely the same everywhere? And finally, the solution, once we leave a preconcept, and we, again, we expand your experimental procedure without having, just thinking of some of a, or <laughs> abandoning a preconcept about what animal can do or not do, just a, 
increase your technical, uh, increase your field of work, I would say. And what we did is, uh, you see, this is a level animal reach there when they're in the upper Abyssinia, those which never hardly are flooded. Then lower Abyssinia and middle and lower Abyssinia, those were places where we were making experiments. And then upper rhizophora, the rhizophora which they never, which is never inhabited as snails. The rhizophora tree, forest, which the one which is just in face of the open lagoon. And here the animal is going very high in this period. And then we start going again, just in the middle of the lagoon. Well, let's, don't for, let's forget about trees, about uh, our experimental beloved site and what the animals are liking or not liking. Just go ahead till in the middle of the lagoon. And suddenly we found that in the middle of the lagoon, the animals don't climb as high. This is the rhizophora in front of the lagoon, just 10 meters away, say, from the, from the, from the forest edge. And this is uh, 70 meters away from the, from the forest edge. So the animals are not, this is the profile of the coast. And this is the, the density, of the, sorry, the animal behavior. And then we start to compare, to correlate, to correlate the shore level and the snail's aid, which is not significant. And we correlate the, 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 the snail aid and the density of Avicinia marina, which is the, the, their beloved trees, the leaves they live with. And it doesn't make any sense. But if we compare the, the snail's level with the rhizophora, density, the trees they don't like, the trees which is disliked, the trees which are living on lower level, but the trees, not the open ocean. Okay, the open ocean will be zero density. The open lagoon is zero density. But here is the, as more rhizophora is dense, as more, as higher as the density of rhizophora, as higher as the level that snails reaches. It means what? That the rhizophora is releasing some chemical which doesn't tell you exactly what to do with yourself, which, which uh, in terms of aid to reach, perhaps. But they simply tell you that you have to go away. This is a dangerous place. So the animals is perhaps adding some, some movement that we're ready to do. So this is, I will walk 80 centimeters. Today is 80 centimeters trip. But if you are in a forest, which is terrifying odor, animal will add something uh, and go much higher. It's no very rude and, and, and simply and simple and naive explanation, but uh, hypothesis. I say, but that's all I can tell you. That's all we I can tell you about that. In fact, to be close to rhizophora, which is a, a cue related to hostile environment, elicit a higher a, a, a migration of the snails. No more details than that. This was done. Uh, this was my last. Absolutely, very last experiment in uh, three years ago. Last hypothesis: the soil vibration. Do you remember we talk about the the the? Oh, mamma mia, perché vai così? Cosa ho fatto? We talk. I told you that the soil vibration due to the wave impact. This could be again. Remember that we are working here, and the wave is here. The reef is around here. So this is, I see, this is two kilometers. This distance would be seven if I calculate it. So the impact of, of, on this reef, is it perceived here by an animal creeping on the floor? So what we do, I don't still know, but what we could do is to put a seismographer, a very small seismographer, a very, very delicate seismographer, seismographer, seismograph, I guess in English, yeah, on the floor somewhere. We have two of this stuff. And uh, we've been recorded for two weeks only, unfortunately, or even less. And uh, what we found, there was finally a relationship. This is a low frequency wave. It is a 24 hours reef. This is the trucks and cars along the main way, Malindi, Mombasa, you know, with a very active at daytime and very low active at nighttime. But this is a pattern which is, you know, see, very high at spring tide and very low in ebb tide, and with a periodicity which is not 24 hours. Unfortunately, this is a fragment of what we should have shown if we could have stayed there longer with more instruments and so on. But that's what we didn't do it, unfortunately. 
but we could at least you know the, we could uh, put a, a question mark <laughs> at the end of the, our paper. Could ambient vibration be related with the snail's migration? Uh, information is there. We don't know if a snail can react to it. We don't know if a snail can perceive it. But for the first time, we find an information in the environment. We can tell exactly when the tide will come and how intense, how high the tide is going to be. Because the same information is giving both the same stuff, the vibration, intensity of the vibration is carrying both signals at the same time. Okay, so if this was the solution, I don't know yet. But unfortunately, we don't know, we don't know yet. C'era la nostra amica doveva farmi una foto, tra un po' We don't know yet because uh, my co-works are here, my main co-works and, and the last two co-works I had in this trip, in these uh, 10 years of work are Sara Fratini and Anna Marta Lazzari. And Sara Fratini is working now population genetics in uh, crab population genetics in Hong Kong or somewhere else. And Anna Marta is studying uh, bioma, uh, bees bioma, uh, microbiology stuff in uh, Sassari University. And so, I'm here with no possibility of funds or whatever to go there again. And so if you have ideas or funds or you know how to apply to go ahead, if you are interested in if you going ahead for these experiments, you are welcome. I, I could tell you what, all the tricks I know, all the things I didn't tell in this short or perhaps not too short talk. But uh, so for the moment, since we were the only one, the only team working on, on, on the Semitidia, except someone making faunistics, faunistics, uh, faunistics uh, investigation. Yeah? But we are just really for 10 years, we have been very alone and very isolated in this kind of study, which is very relaxing, I would say. I guess that you, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure she understands me. And very relaxing, but uh, there is no descendant, there are no, no inheritance. And that's uh, the end of my talk, I guess. Riguardo all'ipotro del Gicost, avete mai guardato se i muscoli che sono coinvolti nel, nello strisciamento in verticale e nello strisciamento orizzontale sono gli stessi o no? Cioè, un fatto di movimento è diverso oppure è identico? Perché si assemblerebbe che c'è un discorso di famiglia, no? Sì. Quando l'animale non usa certi mm. tipi di muscoli dovrebbe resettare la fatica. Allora, senti, guardandoli hanno l'aria di muoversi, fanno proprio dei passettini a questa maniera, va bene? sia in verticale che in orizzontale. In tutte le nostre ricerche non abbiamo, mai, abbiamo avuto dei geologi, dei botanici, dei fisici, ma non abbiamo mai avuto un fisiologo coinvolto. Quindi andare a vedere quale fosse il muscolo coinvolto non saprai nemmeno come fare, piantare degli elettrodi in un animalino, sì, si può fare, certo, i lugolini li piantano nei talitri, si, si potrà fare anche una cosa, non l'abbiamo mai fatto. No, 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 una cosa si poteva fare, la, la frequenza cardiaca si potrebbe fare, con quelle tecniche anche che l'azio va messa a punto, una volta si può mettere un piccolo device a infrarossi sopra e vedere cosa succede quando cambia da un meccanismo all'altro, forse gli batte il cuore un po' più veloce quando vanno in verticale, può darsi. Però resta il fatto che la maniera di decidere in termini di, di quantità di energia da investire resta una cosa piuttosto stra, straordinaria. Insomma. Beh, sarebbe bellino più che altro modificargli il metabolismo degli zuccheri, non so, qualcosa del genere, che bloccargli e vedere che cosa fanno. Senti, allora, una domanda anche io legata a questa domanda. Dunque, intanto mi chiedevo quanto in condizioni normali, non sperimentali, qual è la probabilità di trovarsi davanti a uno, a uno scalino a marciapiede, come l'hai chiamato? Po, pochissimo. No. L'unica cosa... L'unica cosa che possano trovare, siccome i, i tronchi di mangrovia sono abbastanza contorti, sembrano un po' i nostri olivi quasi, bene? quindi possono, possono trovare ogni tanto un pezzettino così, ma insomma... Quindi sotto questo... Sì, 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 sì. Quindi non è... Mm, no, no. Quanto riguarda la, 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 la spesa di energia, mm. no? che è quella che figura, dico anche lì, in natura può capitare di essere eh, 
ha pesantiti per esempio mm. da, in certe condizioni, non so, gli rimane del fatto attaccato al dosso mm. o qualcosa del genere, non so che peso possa sì, sì. eh, portare, mm. a che peso addizionale possa portare. Ma... Allora, ne... Abbia, sì, abbiamo anche visto, cioè, allora, l'animale eh, quando piove è bagnato e quando non piove è secco, anche quello, qualche piccola differenza la può fare, però abbiamo, il fango a volte sì, a volte ci può restare, ma insomma pochissima roba perché non entrano mai dentro il fango, no? proprio loro si nutrono del film algale che, che, che corre sulla superficie, che si deposita o cresce addirittura in quelle poche ore sulla superficie del fango. Come, eh, sì, sempre, sì, qualche volta si sono viste un po' sporcate però ricordati con il piombo si è vista anche una modificazione la, una piccola modificazione del peso quasi non se ne accorgevano si vedeva un sistema di compensazione quando comincia a 70 allora se ne accorgono quindi comunque diciamo dovrebbero salire un po' meno sì. Sì. però ripeto quel, quel, quella piccola quantità di fanga a volte l'abbiamo visto sopra non esiste, no. Semmai l'altra cosa interessante è che la loro paura è sempre quella di essere lavate via dalle onde e a volte si trovano, quando c'è la, 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 la vicegna, l'albero e loro vogliono sta in alto, ma davanti c'è la foresta di rizofra, ma non sempre. In certi casi la foresta di rizofra non c'è e quindi è la vicegna a essere in prima fila e quindi essere in prima fila e trovare, sì, a un certo punto le ondate, la, 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 il fringing, come si dice, la, il bagna asciuga, bene, che, che battono le onde. E, e, e allora lì siccome la vicegna il livello rispetto al mare è buono per loro e quindi ci sono ma l'onda parta via e lì non riescono a restare aggrappati con forza infatti si va lì ci sono ancora un po' ma sono tutte gigantesche sono le più grandi e robuste quelle più piccole finiscono per caso c'è un sistema di random walk per cui questi ci rendono un po' da un albero non sono fedeli agli alberi Vabbè, ogni tanto cambiano da un albero all'altro, cioè quando finiscono in una zona non protetta vengono gravate via dal mare, predate poi da granchi, e la, salvo quelle che ce la fanno, allora restano le poche grasse su quelle, evidentemente eh, hanno l'energia sufficiente non soltanto per salire, ma anche per restare aggrappate, è un altro punto importante. E restano attaccati, fanno una cosina di muco, fanno una cosina di muco che secca e restano incollati, perché non sono aggrappati col piede. Loro ritirano il piede, si chiudono tutti, e quindi restano sigillati, non perdono più acqua e restano incollati con questo muco secco. Un attimo, poco prima, che sia il momento giusto, l'orologio biologico, eh, o chi per lui, o le vibrazioni dell'autostrada, o che ne so, eh, tirano fuori il capino, rimettono il piede sul tronco e cominciano a scendere. Eh, ai, ai, ai messi. L'abbiamo fatto aprendo un'altra finestra inquietante sul fatto che non sono fedeli ai tronchi, perché si vede che se te li metti sul tronco A e B e poi crei un pipe, un tubo nel mezzo, dopo un po' vedi che, quindi li prendi e li porti tutti sul tubo, si facevano granchi tanti anni fa, ognuno tornava sul suo palbero, i granchi. Invece loro vanno a casa, mezzi a casa e mezzi a quell'altro, erano assolutamente non fedeli. Però nella fase in cui sono fedeli per qualche giorno stanno su quell'albero tendono a essere fedeli a un punto particolare e li ritrovi marcandoli li ritrovi sempre scendono e poi tornano esattamente lì anche lì non sappiamo bene presumibilmente ritracciando il loro traccia mucosa però è tutto un capitolo che, era, che studiava il mio collega Clazzi che lascerò, lascerei a lui se mai volesse o se avesse voluto studiare quindi la tracciatura individuale diventa complicato, di nuovo ci vuole sistemi, si è tentato, ad esempio non si riesce a obbligare gli animali a stare su una superficie, se li metti su una tavola cioè, allora la puoi fare più facilmente, se stai intorno a un tubo gli animali passano di là di là, diventa difficile, cioè mettergli una tavola e eh, passano di dietro, cioè è semplice, gli si mette delle cose intorno e non possono, che non possano passare, quindi li metti su una superficie e poi gli fai una cornice di materiale impenetrabile, insormontabile, non esiste, non esiste materiale, queste chiocciole possono sormontare. Si è portato giù zerbini, tra i più grossi zerbini ispidi di plastica, eh, rete, aggrovigliate, che funzionavano benissimo con le nostre chioccioline delle scoglie di, 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 di Calafuria, le, le, le piccole monodonta, quelle si, si reggimentano come si vuole. Queste non c'è bene, passavano tutti, quindi non si riusciva a obbligarli a stare davanti alla nostra fotocamera o telecamera perché se ne vanno a spasso. 
Quindi, però c'è il sospetto, anzi più che il sospetto, che in certi periodi sono fedeli a un punto particolare. Quindi studiosi di homing potete divertirvi. Sì. 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 Beh, nei due, quello della piattaforma si sì, era riferito a quello che stava sopra, soprattutto, e quello che poi ho levato, perché l'esperimento è molto simile, invece era su un tubo, ugualmente, in cui li abbiamo messi, mentre gli animali avevano iniziato la salita, gli abbiamo tirato fuori il tubo da 30 cm fuori dal fango, va bene? Quindi il controllo era sollevato e riabbassato, quindi stesse vibrazioni, manipolazioni, eccetera. Invece questa attività l'abbiamo sollevata e quindi se gli animali avevano informazioni, guardavano giù in terra esattamente, avevano delle informazioni, sarebbero fermati prima dei controlli, giusto? Perché se lo sollevi, invece andava come quello. Se li sollevi il tubo mentre camminano, vanno più su, tanto di quanto l'hai sollevato te. Quindi non c'è... No, avrebbe spiegato perché quando, quando fai il pochino della piattaforma sì. artificiale... Mm. Quando è molto grande, loro percepiscono quella come. Esatto, e di fatto io l'avevo tagliato corto, non pensavo ci fosse uno così attento ad aver capito la sottigliezza, complimenti, <ride> l'avevo tagliato corto. Quindi quello dimostrava una certa cosa che non si guardano intorno, guardando le, gli alberi intorno. Quell'altro che guardavano giù, se riuscivano proprio a valutare la distanza da terra, non sembra che ci sia per niente. Poi hanno un grande cervello, questi animali, sono, e hanno due occhini, vicini, ma sono ancora una volta diffidare dalla, dalla interpretazione a priori, poi si scopre se hanno fatto delle cose straordinarie, un organo di senso che magari ancora non conosciamo. Un'altra domanda? Quando hai preso i vari formati sotto, quando hai preso sì. lo scambio, sì. abbiamo visto che arrivano fino a lui. Sì, certo, anche il contrario. Sì, sì. Quelli che stavano allagati, io, che io ho tagliato per semplicità, ho scorciato. Ma finiscono sott'acqua e non ridite. Eh, sono lì a terra, tanto dice qui la marea non viene, bluff, arriva l'acqua, scappano, mi matti. E anche a loro ci vuole circa quattro maree. Abbiamo poi scoperto, cercato di capire un'altra cosa e dimostrato che non c'è l'effetto gruppo. Bene, quindi che loro, se questi animali che porti giù e che quindi restano allagati all'inizio e che quindi poi devono, detto, ci mettono quattro giorni, otto maree per imparare, se messi in un tubo pieno di animali che già sanno il far loro, oppure isolati in un tubo in cui sono soli, non c'è nessuna differenza e non c'è nessun apprendimento trasversale, nessuna informazione parassitata da quelli che già sanno. Quindi ognuno per sé, sicuramente, però è chiaro il, il contrario. È, anzi, noi dopo un po' siamo abituati a finire da ridere a vederli che stanno lì fermi, arriva l'acqua, cominciano disperatamente, quindi pensa, cosa c'ha nella testa, mi ho sbagliato tutto. Prego, si è finito. Vai, vai, sì. Volevo sottolineare l'intelligenza di fare tutti questi esperimenti, no? Una volta, una volta. In campo, è un po' più che in campo, perché qui è letteralmente in mezzo a sì, certo. eh, e eh, inventando volta per volta le, le varie cose da fare. La domanda che faccio è questa, ma se dove ti trovi le tende o i lumi? Le tende le trovate, trovate in Italia, naturalmente. Ma quando hai alzato la, eh, la piattaforma c'era un tavolimento di parte? Eh, quello è tutto, sì, 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 tutta roba fatta lì. La, tecnologia più, la cosa più grossa era andare dal negozio dell'indiano e fornisce materiale da costruzione e dire mi dai altri tre pipe ma tagli, perché li vendono a tubi di 6 metri di lunghezza no? di me li dai altri tre pipe e me li tagli a segmenti di 2 metri l'uno quindi questo le cose Dopo il terzo anno, si andava a fare, era un indiano molto impassibile, non ci chiedeva mai nulla. Il terzo anno si andò lì a richiedere gli altri sei mesi di dubbi tagliati. Cioè, alla fine calò, ma che cavolo ci fa? Allora, spiegando, fu un'avventura, spiegando che si faceva a 6.000 di nomi da casa, quanti sono lì con tutta questa banda di studenti, soldi, eccetera, eccetera per studiare queste iocioline che lui non aveva neanche mai visto in vita sua, era a un chilometro di distanza quella era piuttosto imbarazzata ma per il resto potrei dare soltanto come lezione che quando alla prima esperimenti non si era visto cioè l'orologio biologico l'ennesimo esperimento dimostra che gli animali che stanno sulla, dove c'è la marea stanno, hanno un orologio in sincronia alla marea, dov'è il problema va bene? 
e fino a che non si entra un po' chiaro il meccanismo, uno comincia a studiare un po' meglio queste maree, quindi le cose in una vita mia non le ho mai studiato, se non quegli gli elementi fondamentali che tutti sappiamo, però se ti accorgi che insomma, questa marea però è complicata, che vuol dire l'orologio optidale? L'orologio optidale oggi arriva una marea, domani dovrebbe arrivare tra 48 minuti dopo, invece viene due ore dopo, sale, scende, quindi, quindi se non ci si metteva per caso, quasi, quasi per caso a riflettere su questo fatto, se l'ha fatto il nostro lavoro, se l'ha vista gli animali che hanno questo orologio e mantengono questo ritmo, li porti su o giù e fanno li poi allagare o non, eccetera, ma è stato fatto su altre specie, una se l'ha fatto il Chelazzi nel 71-72 in Somalia con le chiocciole costiere, vede sulla costa. La differenza delle chiocciole costiere è che la chiocciola costiera tutti i giorni arriva il mare e tutti i giorni li sbatte addosso l'ondata e tutti i giorni loro possono percepire prima che quando si, si sente arriva l'ondata a, a picchiare sulla base della scogliera e queste chiocciole poi si arrampiano e poi arriva l'onda infine le bagna quindi queste invece hanno un meccanismo in cui l'acqua non entra mai in contatto perché quando salite sull'albero e si richiudono dentro si attaccano alla corda e si richiudono dentro Arriva la marea, lo sa Gesù che arriva la marea rispetto a Fernando, ma loro, per quanto riguarda loro, sono chiuse e sigillate dentro. Poi c'è qualcuno che dice fuori, e eh, aprono eh, fuori, come face Berlinguetti voglio bene, non avete mai visto Berlinguetti voglio bene? <ride> come dice la rivoluzione, pronti, attenti, via! <ride> e loro, se l'avete visto, guardate. E, 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 e quindi pronti, attenti, via, e, e, e c'è... Chi glielo dice? Non lo so, l'orologio biologico, però l'orologio biologico appunto ha capacità di adattarsi in maniera incredibile con questi pattern flu. E poi l'altra cosa di lezione, per, per così se, se ha un senso dirvi queste cose, è quella che ci si limitava dentro le mangrovie, gli esperimenti dentro le mangrovie, più lontani si va, più salgono, e succede. L'idea di andare avanti fino a un piano oceano, fregandosene, e poi si portarono sulla costa, nel giardino di casa mia, va bene? poi sulla costa dell'oceano fuori, va bene? dove, dove c'era il bar che si figliava la sera al gine e tonico, arriva con, questa, con questo palo di plastica in nostra secchiata d'animale, e lì sull'oceano salgono come a casa loro, pochissimo, ora vi ho risparmiato anche dei dettagli, e all'inizio non si capiva, poi dice, ma portiamo la laguna e si vede benissimo, che non, cioè, non è che loro sanno quanto è fonda quell'acqua, non sanno arrivi lì che lì c'è un arriverà una marea di domeni, sentono che c'è l'odore di un albero terribile e gli fa paura e schizzano su, se non c'è più salvano il giusto anche se poi se sono sull'oceano vengono sbatacchiati via loro il tronco tutto dalle onde, cioè, quindi non c'è nessuna nulla di misterioso nel loro comportamento, non c'è nessuna capacità extrasensoriale, li porti in un posto dove c'è un odore e scappano, se non c'è l'odore non scappano. Volete andare un giorno con Mancuso? Infatti, gliel'ho proposto una volta. Sapete, quel neurobiologo botanico, mi dice prima, il neurobiologo vegetale, a studiare quale siano isolare, quali siano gli odori che gli fanno paura. Lui sarebbe, ha gli strumenti per farlo. E allora lui ci mandò quella studentessa che misurava la differenza di potenziale tra radici e foglie. Bene? Quindi, eh, quindi un, un possibile filone potrebbe essere questo: andare a scoprire quali sono gli odori, marker chimici nell'aria che spaventano gli animali, ammesso esistono, ammesso che poi si sia sbagliato tutto.